Hello, everybody. Melanie Harwood here from Educate Global. And boy, oh boy, do I have an amazing guest for you here today. I have a wonderful speaker called Malati Widgson, and she is the founder and creator of a fantastic initiative called Youthtopia. And I am going to be handing over to her because as part of the Sustainable Schools Virtual Summit, we are looking at the most innovative, incredible, motivational, wildest, the best in the world for every school to become a sustainable school. So Malati, I'm gonna hand over to you, take it away. Thank you so much, Melanie, and hello, everybody. Um, my name is Malati. I'm 19 years old and a full-time change maker. Um, I'm recording this video live from Bali, Indonesia, which I'm very lucky to be calling my home. I grew up here, born and raised. I'm a Bali baby, naturally. Um, and my activism journey really started at the age of 12 years old. Um, so, you know, growing up here on the island, there was plastic pollution everywhere. Indonesia, as, as a country, we're the second largest source of marine plastic pollution. So Why? growing up here, exactly, I know, Why? it's insane. It's insane, but we're, we're, because, okay, so when we look at it 20 years ago, plastic, nobody knew what that was even here on the island of Bali. We still had our traditional ways. 20 years ago, think about that, right? With um, our local traditional ways of living that were so much more in harmony with nature, because we had this concept. The Balinese have um, this way of living called tri hita karana. And it basically means to live in harmony with the environment around you, the community around you, and the spirit within. So when we talk about sustainability, this is exactly the, the measurement, the metric that we should be looking at. Are we living in harmony? Meaning do not take more than you can give. Living in this balance in all aspects of our lives, right? Um, and this was something that came to, to just everyday life here in Bali. So when plastic got introduced, there was no long-term consequence that anybody was telling us. There was no, um, uh, no handbook of how to use this material. So similar to sustainable materials, which we just threw away, plastic came, it was cheaper, it was easier. Nobody had to spend time weaving baskets. Nobody had to spend time, um, you know, creating the, 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 the packages. It just came ready to go, ready to use right now. And because of that, we used it, a lot of it, and we just simply threw it away without asking the question of where away was. So that's what really started my, my activism journey at 12 years old, together with my 10 year old sister at the time. And we just said enough, what are we gonna do about it? We don't wanna wait on the sidelines. And that's kind of just what brought me to where I am today. Malati, what, what was the catalyst? Where did you, what, what was the light bulb moment? What did you, were you reading an article? Were you in a classroom? Where did it happen? Can you, do you remember? I, I struggle with this question because um, I, I think, you know, it was just so many moments, so many, like a collection of moments that just created this, you know what, we, we have to take action. And, you know, we're, we're raised in a family, my dad's Indonesian, my mom's Dutch, two completely different cultures. And they created a whole new world for me and my sister to grow up in with these, you know, family traditions every single night, a family dinner that lasted way after you finished eating conversation based right um we were really lucky to go to the green school here in bali this bamboo cathedral school no walls um really believing in how do we create green leaders and so we were encouraged by our teachers our community to ask bigger questions and all of this combined when me and my sister started recognizing plastic pollution recognizing that plastic was ending up in places that it shouldn't we thought okay well we cannot wait on the sidelines. So it was a combination of all of these moments that spurred us to create Bye Bye Plastic Bags. Wow. So Malati, you were 12 years old and you are now 19. Yes. So what, when you, when you decided, right, at 12 years old, I'm going to become an activist, what did you do? What was the first thing that you did? Ooh, the first thing, well, we had no business plan, no strategy. 
And it was this huge passion and my sister and I got together and we started brainstorming. The first thing we knew, you had to get a team together. And this is something that we always do in our workshops to um, young people all around the world. What, what are those actions? Where do you start? And number one lesson for us was always team. So we pulled together our best friends and we would host our first team meetings every snack time and lunch time, every chance we got basically. So you got this team together. How many were in your team? Um, I, f I think if I look back at the very first few meetings, it was maybe like a handful of friends, like five, six around the table. And then we started to grow because of our actions, because of our presentations, because of the workshops. We were present on social media. We were at every community gathering. We were at every rally. We were organizing. We were gathering. And um, we started to grow to now today being one of the largest youth-led NGOs in the country. So I wanted to ask you, what was the process for you over those, so between the age of 12 and now 19, what have you been doing over those years? What, what are the milestones? What in your, because it's, it's very easy as the creator and the founder of a, of a, of a process and a, of, a, of an initiative, you are living it day to day. So you forget what the milestones are. Hmm. In your mind, were there milestones? Were there these major points in your trajectory till now that really defined where you see yourself going? Yeah, I think this, this comes with the whole no business plan, no strategy thing when we first started. So we were really learning as we, go, as we went. Um, and, you know, with our team, with the many different opinions, perspectives, guidelines, timelines set by a lot of different people, it was definitely hard to, um, even still today, I always ask the question, how do you sort of measure impact, right? That's one of the biggest questions I'm asking on the grounds every day, because I'm, I'm the happiest person when a student comes up to me and says, I want to create change because of your story. But I'm also super happy when a business comes to me and I'm saying, okay, we banned plastic straws last month. But how do you, what's the metric system there that we use? But the milestones or the goal, the vision was always very clear, right? Make our island home of Bali plastic bag free. And throughout that, like a lot of different journeys and milestones, whether it was speaking to 150,000 students, distributing uh, uh, educational booklets, mm -hmm distributing alternative bags. These were all milestones that kind of grew with us and grew with our message and our journey as we evolved with it. Now you haven't just stayed in Bali though. You, you, you've gone global. Yes. So what was that? That must have been another milestone. <laughs> that was a huge milestone and totally an unexpected one. Again, like my sister and I, we just spoke, you know, from our hearts, from a place of passion and pure excitement that we got to stand up for what we believed in. And kids all around the world started resonating with that, right? They saw other young people their age uh, stand up for something. And that's where by plastic bags, we started getting lots of emails like, we wanna do the same specifically towards plastic pollution. And that's where we're now in 50, uh, 50 locations around the world in 29 countries, all led by you know middle school students all the way up to graduating university students. Now, where you and I are different is my, my, my mission is to upskill teachers to be the creme de la creme of climate literacy, train the trainers, deliverers of all of this knowledge. You, you want to upskill children. You have a, you want to appear to peer, train the trainer kids. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Unlock their potential. Okay, so what do you think you personally, what do you think you can achieve with Youthtopia in the next 12 months? What is your mission? What's your vision? Ooh, la, so much. The, the vision is so big. It, was, it took me so long to be able to articulate it. And still to this day, I don't think I do it justice. But basically, uh, you know, after seven years on the front lines with bioplastic bags, meeting 150,000 students on a face-to-face -face basis, right? Like so much more time spent in other kids' classrooms rather than my own classroom. And yet there was a common thread, no matter where we were, Tokyo, New York City, or the island next door here in Indonesia. And kids always ask the same question. How can I do what you do? 
So that's what you, where Utopia comes in. We want to create that space where young people can come together and learn from each other, right? Utopia, our vision and our goal, especially in the next 12 months, I'm hoping already tomorrow, that's what we're working towards every day when we wake up, is to be the headquarters for young change makers um, and really living with this philosophy of peer-to-peer -peer education, right? Because that's where, where, through my own experience, now being 19, but speaking already at the age of 12 with more young people is that every time I went in front of a classroom together with my sister, together with my team, students would sit a little taller, lean a little closer, and they would always say, hang on a second. If you can do it, that means I can do it too. And so that's the, that's the spice that we feel we have at Utopia and um, why we're working very hard every single day to bring frontline real life young change makers into our network. Mm, I love it. I love it, Malati. My background, we spoke earlier before we started with this um, summit, um, was that I, be, I was a handwriting specialist and I created a handwriting scheme for my own daughter. But where my program was different was that my daughter became the presenter. She was the mm -hmm. peer, -to peer teacher, peer to peer deliverer of information. And I quickly started noticing, it's interesting the words you use where children sit, come closer, sit up and listen. And I noticed, and I've, I've got footage of it, where I have an entire classroom where this little four-year-old is on the screen and she says, sit up straight, shoulders back, both feet on the floor, don't forget your start. And you watch them all like little automatons. Oh, boom, bang, boom. And it's interesting where you say, because I was thinking, you know, like for me a few years ago, Starfy was my whole life. I mean, I, 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 I still do. I eat, sleep, breathe handwriting because I know that if you can write, you are a deeper cognitive thinker, you are a change maker instantly. Life, you can access all of the curriculum, you can, you can get your creative ideas down, you are free to start expressing. Um, and I know that to have, to deliver climate literacy, we have to deliver literacy on a, on a massive scale globally. And it's interesting where you say that children were sitting up and listening to you because I've seen that with what I've been building in the past. But I took a segue, <laughs> you know, Starfy sort of like took a back seat for some reason, I don't know what happened. And I just thought, right, I, I have a mission and I'm going to upskill teachers. And you clearly had your segue where you said, right, I'm on a mission, I'm going to upskill the youth change makers around the world. You, I, I don't think, I don't think you, that was in your plan, but it just happened. It exactly. Just I do feel like it's it's just a natural next step. And especially looking at the time we're living in, there's so much need for young people to feel like they have a voice, where they feel like they have meaning and, again, purpose in creating tangible, impactful change. And same as the teachers. I think the only reason why me and my sister are here is because we've had a community of teachers around us that created that sense of support, that were always there. And, um, you know, I think that that's, that's re it's such important work. Malati, I want to ask you, where you are very different, you are not a not-for-profit, you're not an NGO, you are a for-profit company. And your vision statement, your mission statement, is to empower others, LDCs, schools, and children around the world to take their ideas and to make lots of money out of their environmental visions and missions and their strategy. I want to know from you, why do you feel that that earning of an income is so important to those with these environmental ideas? Yeah, I think, well, for starters, Utopia, we do have a hybrid, right? Because I think from the last seven years running a non-for-profit, running an NGO, I've learned a lot of lessons there. And I think that with making money, there is nothing wrong with that. What? The way we make money, the way we distribute the money, that is what matters. And that's what we have to you know, change narrative around. I think um, what we need to see more than ever is making sure that people and young people especially understand that there is space that is growing 
that is just necessary for us to be making good in the world and to be making money and that that is possible and not just by young people but by businesses by industry by uh, organization it's the new business model and we need to think in that bigger picture of how to be sustainable on all levels i had a fantastic meeting um with a chance meeting with a gentleman who worked in the in the fossil fuel industry for many many years and he's been he spent the last 20 years developing a, a prototype of a new um free energy system a product and we were talking about what happens when you when you shift um the norms and he said well you know what if you remove fossil fuels overnight if you just you know you legislate against it innovation comes business comes new strategies new learning he said yeah you you you, you suffer the pain you cut it off and and innovation and you know and i was like wow <laughs> and he said you know we we're so we were almost embarrassed about saying oh yes we have to charge for this oh we have to make money for this but let's face it if you don't make money you don't eat that's the way that our world is set up at the moment we're no more bartering our world runs on a capitalist system so by mm -hmm. using that capitalist system and making money out of good you are empowering entire communities and individuals and society. So it's not just about, we maybe have to change our mindset. So I'd love for you to create me a course on that, please. Yes, sounds like a plan. <laughs> That's it. I, I've got a whole list of courses that I want you to create for Utopia. Yeah, I've got a whole list for you already. <laughs> We're on it. Now, I would love to know, where do you see what you are doing going into particular stratas of society because you you you're you're focusing on children but you know the children um indirectly go and teach their peers and their parents and their their wider world where yeah. do you see this going uh i think definitely um I, we have so much potential to really wake and shake up everything and when we talk about a systemic change you know gen z and the rising generation we're already all asking the bigger questions. How do we create these new systems? How can we challenge our leaders? How, what are the right um, uh, sort, sorts of channels of answers, right? And I think that um, for me, one of the biggest end goals is a, a system, systemic level change, whether it's policy, whether it's leadership structures. Um, and I think young people have that ability to create those conversations, but then also, um, hold those people in positions of power accountable, right? For us, sure, we are Gen Z, we are the, the generation on social media, we're the generation online, but we have methods, we have ways of, okay, coming back, following up, really not going until the job is done. And that's, you know, why I'm still here after seven years, which feels for me like a really long time, but I know it's not enough. The work is only just beginning. So I think that young people, the, the vision that I really feel like, with once Utopia, you come through the program, you feel like you've learned all the basic skills of how to be a young change maker. You actually go out there on a local global scale, but you start changing the world around you. Mm. And I think that that's the potential that each and every one of us young people have, but we just get stuck at the question of where do I start? How do I build a team? Simple questions that all of us at the front lines have lived through since we were age 12 have lived through since we started our first NGO. So compiling all of this knowledge through young people for rising young change makers, that's what Utopia is about. Fantastic, fantastic. We're going to come back to sustainable schools. Do you think that schools can utilize your training and your programs to make money? Definitely. Um, I think this is something that I'm really interested and excited to grow with the program and to see how that can evolve. But I think schools in general have, again, massive potential that they're not harnessing at the moment to one, invest and empower their students fully um, and not, not beyond the grades and beyond an A plus sort of um, paper. But secondly, uh, em empowering the environment and creating that into a sustainable 
sanctuary almost, right? My sister and I, we went to the green school, so you can't really expect anything else coming out of my mouth, but we had compostable um, like toilets. We uh, learned how to garden uh, from like grade three. Our job was to take the school lunch leftovers to the pigs on the, on the campus. We started to, you know, really understand again, the sustainability aspect. And for us at a school level that started with creating connection with the environment real life connection. Um, and I think that that's also a huge foundation of what led me to where I am today. Do you know, it's fascinating you, you talk about that. Um, we, I did an interview with another lady. She's a business manager of a multi-academy trust. So she's a business manager of 17 schools in the United Kingdom. Her name is Margaret Land. Fantastic, fascinating talk. And she is passionate about the environment, but she's an accountant. And what she does is she goes into those 17 schools and she looks at their budgets and she looks at how by making those schools more environmentally friendly and sustainable, how she can save thousands and thousands of pounds for those schools budgets. So schools are constantly saying to us, we don't have any money. We can't afford this. We can't afford books. Why are you telling us about this? And then you say to them, but hang on a minute. If you just follow these simple, practical steps, mm -hmm. okay, you know, she has a, a checklist for you. This is the business manager of a multi-academy trust. If she can save one school 70,000 pounds a year, just by turning off the lights, everybody turns and she, she shows you the hard data. She shows you how having solar panels did not deliver the financial savings, but by individual action, turning off lights saved more than 77,000 pounds a year. We have another school, a head teacher, she's gone paperless in two months. She saved 3,000 pounds. 88 trees did not have to be cut down. And so there you go, you start seeing hard data, the hard evidence and the, the money savings that are made, the cost yeah. savings. That, that money can be used for far better things. We filmed a program called the Carbon Footprint Buster Challenge with a lady called Lisa Pugh. And she lives, she walks the walk and she talks the talk. She lives off grid, sustainable, a sustainable life in her own wood. She has the Deer Wood Trust and it's a beautiful forest. And she has compostable toilets, low technology cooking solution, low technology heating. And she shows me the biodiversity of that forest, how it has improved since she turned it into the sanctuary. And I think that from what you are saying is that you've been learning this in school. Now, if every school on the planet was following similar practices and, and, and you know, looking at compostable toilets, asking how much water we, do we use, um, how much does that cost? How much do we waste? Can we afford to? Are we sustainable? We got chickens, Malati, during the lockdown. Don't ask me. They were rescue hens. And those hens have changed my life because I've started realizing how unsustainable we were. We were throwing away all of our peelings and our, our veg and stuff if, to go into compost and I'm like hang on a minute the chickens can eat that and yeah. then the chickens are giving me eggs which I'm bartering and then I'm making I'm not buying pasta I'm making my own I'm not ma I'm making my own tortillas I don't need all the plastic packaging I can make all of this myself I can be far more and my compost bin went down from like that much to like that much just because I was like oh well, okay the potato peels go to the chickens Carrot peels go to the chicken. It's like you say about the pigs, going feed the pigs. Right. But again, it's all about that education, right? And it's interesting. I love hearing um, those hard data and those hard facts because I feel like there is also a level where I uh, there's such a huge disconnect to education, whether it's the work that we did even with government, right? Here you have a bunch of like 14, 15 year olds skipping, not skipping, but you're not going to school to attend okay. a government meeting. School strikes. <laughs> and uh, you know we were in these meetings and it was really like 
you could you could ask so many questions and they had no answers because this department didn't know what this department was doing and similar to schools and asking our, the question of are we sustainable enough what can we do again questions that we should be able to have answers to and it, it takes you know someone to go digging deeper into the financials proving showing that it's not a sacrifice but it's an opportunity and i think that this is a narrative that hopefully especially looking at the global situation we're in right now with something like covid 19 this is a moment in time where we're given an opportunity to reset to restructure look at the way the education industry has changed everybody has moved online we've had to find ways to interact like this um but not only that, that gives us a question of the campus, right? If we are days on campus, how can we make that experience more sustainable to, again, ignite bigger questions that kids are starting to ask? I think it's, it's so needed, um, not only the content that we're teaching, but the space that we're learning in. Malashi, asking something personal about you, you don't have to answer. Are you studying? Are you in university? Are you doing a degree course at the moment? I graduated a year early from green school and um, I decided to take a gap year and that gap year has just extended itself. Um, and I'm really focusing, you know, I introduced myself as well as full-time change maker. And um, that's literally what I have become um, and what my gap year has turned out to be. So really what I'm focusing my time on is, is Utopia, because again, that is the natural next step. And in a way, um, it's all about alternative education. So I wanted to explore this space before going into a more, linear maybe traditional uh learning because i also have to say i'm super lucky to be one of the you know people under 30 in some of these conference rooms you know some like the youngest person at um a scientific panel debate about why we need to stay below the 1.5 like all of these incredible access of knowledge right in front of me um on a panel after or a keynote before like and here you have it, the world's best entrepreneurs, the leading scientists, the government representatives. And I'm in these rooms and sure, it's not a university hall or a lecture, but I, I, I see it as equally important. And uh, I'm learning a lot still every day, so much to learn, um, but just not in, the, not in the typical way. Where do you see yourself in five years time what do you feel that you want to have achieved in five years what's your plan when i am 25 i definitely want utopia to be up and running fully functional on its own so that i can go take a vacation <laughs> no, i'm kidding um no i definitely uh you know what i'm i'm so focused every single day on the what's the next day what's the next day to look like so my 25 year plan is that we have um, become that global headquarters all around the world that kids like me who necessarily didn't want to go to university can spend a gap year or so exploring utopia and our alternative route. Um, but yeah, personally, where do I want to be? Probably still here in Bali, probably still doing something in the environment and educational space. Um, and yeah, written a couple books here and there. <laughs> So what in, 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 the, in the best case scenario, what do you feel the planet needs to fully reset, to completely rain back on our, on our carbon footprint? Because even if we stop doing everything we've been doing, the effects of how we've been living unsustainably are going to continue for more yeah. than 100 years, even if we stop today, we will not experience the benefit of the changes that we have to make instantly. Our children and our grandchildren, our great grandchildren. What do you think in, in, a, in a utopian, in the, in, if, 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 your, if your dream could happen overnight, what would happen? What do you see? Ooh, good question. I love the question. Um, I think, as you were saying, right, it's damage control at this point. Um, there's, there's nothing, no money, no technology is going to zap everything back and, and halt 
everything. All we can do is implement solutions that we know exist and really implement them today. So if I had a magic wand, that's exactly what would happen from the energy industry, uh, the plastic industry, just understanding that we need a political framework to be able to implement this. And right now that political framework is more creating barriers, creating challenges instead of releasing all of these solutions into our everyday lives. And I think that this is one of the biggest challenges and one of the biggest frustrations of being a young change maker. For example, my own background and where I started with Bio Plastic Bags, it took our youth led movement six years of campaigning before the ban came into place with one single use plastic bag. And before us, there's loads and loads of other organizations that have been at it for years and years and years. There have been so many organizations that worked with us, you know, amplifying the work saying we have to ban plastic bags and yet it still took six years. So that's one example. I think change is happening too slowly. Um, and I, I really believe it's because our systemic structures right now are not changing, not adapting at the pace that we need to change. Um, and it's because there are, there's greed, ego, money-driven intentions, there's politics, and we see everything too short term. We're not able to understand that we're one with it. The environment or one with nature when we look at um, things outside or when we spend time in nature we don't see ourselves as part of it and I think that this again is a narrative that needs to change because then automatically we erase all of that fear to change. Mm -hmm. You know what's very interesting is most people if you ask them about the history of the dinosaurs they seem to think that there was this um, cataclysmic event that went boom and the dinosaurs died instantly but it didn't happen like that that mass extinction took about 50 to 100 years and then the creatures and the critters that could survive they made it through but there were species entire species that died it didn't take it didn't happen from in a flash yes you lost a couple of million but it took for the entire planet, for, for the whole, for the changes to happen, the, the planet became unsustainable. And I think there was, you know, one of the extinctions, everything, um, the first mass extinction, it was unlivable within a year, you know, the, the, within, within mm. it was like a, a nuclear winter, for example, or a, everything changed. And in our minds, we think, ah, this thing, it'll, somebody else will fix it. It's, gonna, it's not going to, you know, they're talking about extinction. Come on, what are they talking about? And we have, we had an amazing program by Sir David Attenborough the other day, all about species extinction. It was called extinction. And they didn't pull their punches because he said, really, look, this is what's happening. This is how many species are dying. This, we are in the fifth mass extinction. And it doesn't happen overnight, but we are passing tipping points. And once you pass those, you will not be able to stop. It will be a runaway process. So the mission that I think we have is to get schools to be sustainable, to start developing the leaders of tomorrow, the leaders like you. We need, we need a couple of hundred thousand Malatis in the world in every country, in every region, in every state, in every town. Because if we had a couple of you, then all of that red tape would just fall away. The, we would un, they would understand those leaders, that army of Greta Thunberg, that army of Malatis, would understand the science, understand the economy, understand the business, understand all the strategies, understand the structures, understand all the issues, the psychological implications, emotional implications, physical implications, and they would be the leaders. Because I feel that we need a, a change. We need to remove anybody that puts a blockage in the way of this positive change, because it's going to be, it's going to happen whether they like it or not, because we cannot, you know, we can't keep living for a handful of individuals that are pumping oil and fossil fuels out because that's that's harmful it's great for them because they think they're making lots and lots of money but it's it's killing millions just as cigarette smoking killed millions before and we were led to believe 
you know, come on, the science is patchy, nobody dies. Well, within 50 years, everybody realized, hey, smoking is bad for you. We've got to stop. Boom. Okay. So the same, we don't have 50 years. We don't have 50 years to combat. We've had those 50 years are gone. We've known for 50 years that the global heating and the climate emergency is here. Even Margaret Thatcher was aware of the climate emergency. There's, there's, she's, it's, all in, it's all written down. It's all there. So we are going to have to create those leaders. And I see Utopia starting to prepare those leaders for their leadership roles. That's where I That's see the plan. That's the plan, Stan. Love it. <laughs> Anati, I want to thank you so very much. This is the first talk with you. And I do hope that we are going to have many, many talks in the future because there are going to be things that you are going to be experiencing and learning in the future that I think our schools, our teachers, our pupils, our parents and their communities and carers, we're going to want to know about these. So where can our listeners contact you? What's the best address to get in touch with you? I want to say Instagram, but that's probably not the best outlet here. So definitely on email. Um, and that's simply bye bye plastic bag without an S at gmail.com or info at utopia.world. Okay. Now, if anybody is listening to this, if you are you're coming via this route via Educate Global, you know that uh, we are support at educateglobal.org. Don't forget there are two C's in Educate Global for climate change. So it's S-U-P-P-O-R-T at Educate Global, E-D-U-C-C-A-T-E-G-L-O-B-A-L dot org. You can contact us. Everything we've spoken about is going to be transcribed and below this video if you are on the virtual summit. If you are listening to the podcast of this, Everything will be transcribed. All of the contact details will be there for you. And what we are asking you to do is to sponsor a school to deliver the Youthtopia training to all of their pupils. That's our mission. So get in touch with us. We are going to be, I don't know, we're going to be partnering, distributing. I don't know what we are. We're going to be doing, Educate Global is most certainly going to be doing a lot of work with youth, Youthtopia in our schools around the world. Well, don't forget, Educate Global, we're in 329,000 schools in 43 countries. We plan to be in all 6 million schools. I think it's 4 million or 6, 6 million schools in the world, 100 million teachers. We have 12 months to get out to every single school to have to set up those sustainability and climate change leadership teams in every school, but we cannot do that without your help because it's not going to take a bureaucracy or a big clunky organization or international development aid. It's going to take individuals like you and like me and like Malati, and you are going to help us fund and sponsor schools. Just one person, one SME, one business, one organization, all you have to do is sponsor and fund one school and partner with that school for the next four to five years. You're not just gonna hand them money and then walk away. You partner with them. It's going to take each and every one of us around the planet to make this change and to make it fast at the speed at which it needs to be made. And from me, Melanie Harwood at Educate Global, I'd like to thank Malati for joining us and we will see all of you on the other side. Thank you, everybody, and goodbye. Thank you, Malati. Bye-bye, then. Bye.